Our Bible study today is on Titus chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as uh, Paul was instructing Titus in this letter about uh, how to teach various groups, we pray that you would help us to, uh, to see the ways in which these things apply to our lives, that we would um, have a greater understanding of, of your calling on our lives, of our responsibilities, and how we might live uh, according to your will and through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so uh, here in the second chapter of Titus, Paul was um, starting this section here just talking about sound doctrine. And last week we had you know, read that section about um, uh, that he must teach in accordance with sound doctrine. So uh, Titus, uh, you know, a young pastor uh, on the island of Crete, and uh, since it wasn't a place where most people had become Christian recently, there wasn't like a, a long-standing Christian community there. Uh, so most of the uh, elders would have been uh, recent converts. And, you know, he, he mentions that uh, elders and pastors should not be recent converts in First and Second Timothy. But in this letter, he doesn't mention that probably out of necessity. <clears throat> but then there has to be some, uh, uh, some guidelines. And so... Uh, for this young pastor, Titus is being told to make sure that the things that they teach are according to the sound doctrine. The word doctrine is just the Greek word for teaching. And so we're talking about the teachings of Christ and the apostles with whom Jesus prepared to uh, spread the gospel. Because Jesus told them specifically, Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything I have uh, told you uh, and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So teaching and baptizing, the two ways in which the gospel was going to be spread, is, uh, is something that Paul, as, as another apostle, right? He, he wasn't one of the 12 apostles, but he, he always says, like in the beginning of this letter, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He always made that claim because it was some, something that Jesus called him into, not that he chose, right? You know, it, you can't, the word apostle means sent one. So if you're sending yourself, you're not an apostle. You're a fake apostle. But Jesus sent him, so he, he made that claim because he wanted people to know that the things he was teaching didn't come from him, but came from Jesus. <clears throat> so that's why he's instructing Titus here. And uh, in that first part of chapter 2, he talked about teaching the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and, and sound in faith and love and endurance. We talked a little bit about that last week. And uh, each one of those... Uh, really fall into the category of the fruit of the Spirit, right? So the older men are to live their lives in, uh, in a way that will bring respect from the community. Even unbelievers should be able to respect a person who is a Christian because we're not supposed to do things that uh, are offensive to the world. Uh, obviously, the, the world will be offended by, by truth, right? I mean, if we say we believe in marriage between a man and a woman, the world doesn't like that, then they will be offended by us. But, but you shouldn't go out of your way to purposely offend people. If you don't agree with them and you tell them you're, if someone's an idiot because they don't believe in God, then that is not um, temperate or worthy of respect or self-controlled. So, uh, you know, Paul says that we should sh uh, preach the gospel uh, in, uh, uh, with... Um, with respect and uh, well i'm thinking maybe of second peter second peter says you know always be prepared to share the hope that you have within you but uh, share it uh with um okay so the passage that i was thinking of is first peter three fifteen. it says but in your hearts set apart christ as lord always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect mm -hmm. So just as Peter is teaching that, you know, the way that we share the gospel is gently mm -hmm. and with respect, so Paul says the same thing to Titus as he's teaching people how to share the gospel. Um, and then he, meant, he closes that section about being sound in faith and love and in, in endurance. In today's uh, section, in verse 3, and back in Titus 2, he says, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers, or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. <clears throat> so, and uh, for the older women in the community, often you know, uh, 
if they were married, you know, then their children would probably be grown up. So what was their job and the role in the community? Uh, a, lot, a lot of times, um, you know, there's the temptation to be a busybody or to maybe gossip. And, uh, you know, and if a person is, um, you know, tempted to, to waste their time, you know, then they would end up doing things like uh, slandering, right? So it has to do with gossip, then addicted to much wine. You know, the, the availability of, you know, sitting around and drinking was something that is still seen today. I mean, you know, what, what kind of people hang out in bars? People who don't have much to do, right? And so um, <clears throat> to teach what is good is to find uh, a purpose for your life. I mean, so what are the purposes that for which God has uh, blessed you and created you? And, you know, that is to care for family. And it doesn't have to be your immediate family. You know, some people aren't, if they're widowed or they don't have children or maybe their children are gone and far away, uh, what, what do we do? Well, we have the family of believers. And the family of believers are those people that God has placed in our lives to uh, encourage and lift up and strengthen. And so the body of Christ is blessed through, um, uh, through lives that are lived for the glory of God. And, and so there's definitely things that every person can do. Um, and so the older women, especially here, to, have, uh, to be reverent in the way they live. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, the, the same moral standards that were applied to men, because it, he also said the same thing about reverence for men, same is true for the women. Uh, and then he mentions not to slander, because maybe that was a particular sin that uh, maybe the older women were um, prone to. Mm -hmm. And then notice he says addicted, not to be addicted to much wine. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say not to drink wine at all. You know, uh, some people you know feel that the only way to avoid um, drinking too much is to not drink at all, right? Mm -hmm. You know, AA teaches that. Obviously, if a person already has a problem, then they teach that the only way you're going to kick this is to come mm -hmm. to the realization that you cannot drink mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. But if that's true for you, that's not always something that we should imply or you know, impose upon another person. Mm -hmm. So I think that the Bible tells us that if, it's, if, if doing something is wrong in, in your own conscience, but the Bible doesn't say that it's wrong, that it's not right for you to impose your conscience on another person. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, we should always consider the other person you know, the Bible says, consider others as better than yourselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're, if you, if a person desires to drink alcohol and they're with a person who is offended by that, then it definitely is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. You just, you know, why would you purposely do something that offends somebody else? And so we, because we care about other people. Uh, so that's part of it as well. So this section here doesn't go in, into those details, but we know that elsewhere in scripture, it's, uh, it's a, uh, these are things that are already uh, talked about, you know, and of course last week in my uh, in the gospel reading I read from John 2 Jesus is at the wedding of Cana and then of course he, he makes turns the water into wine and so even Jesus drank wine um, But the notice that it says not to be addicted. So addictions of any form become a, a God unto themselves. It's really a type of idolatry you know, an addiction is an idolatry. That's, you know, if you think about why does, in Ro I think it's in Romans 1 where Paul says, um, drunk, people who are drunkards and people who are divisive, and then he mentions other particular sins. He says, such people shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He even mentioned, mentions gossipers. How, you know, how can these people be considered so sinful that they won't get into heaven? Well, because what you're doing is uh, addictions are creating an idol that becomes your God. Mm -hmm. And it's true of like any type of lifestyle sin. If you live in a lifestyle sin that is the way that you think and live and act, then you can't have God as your number one in your life because this other thing is controlling you. <clears throat> right? And it could, it's also true of, of politics uh, because that's what it talks about divisiveness. Divisiveness is where you insist that your viewpoint is more important than other people's viewpoints. And then if another person doesn't agree with you, then they're wrong and you're, it's your job to make them right by con con uh, convincing them that they should vote or believe or think like you. Uh, and so that, that kind of divisiveness is really a type of idolatry as well. So okay, here it doesn't get, get into those things, but it's in the same category as those other types of sins. 
Uh, so, you know, just the general warning for the older women of the community, and he's talking about the, the Christians, of course, he's not, this is not an issue uh, for people outside the church. You can't, you know, you, they're not under God's uh, rule. I mean, generally, under, as the, God put a conscience in us, mm-hmm. so all of us have uh, a knowledge of what's right and wrong. And so if you sin against your conscience, you're sinning against God. Mm-hmm. And, and a person who does that already knows deep within them that they're wrong. They may try to hide the fact, and they might not want like the guilt, and they might try to ignore it, but they're still convicted because God put a conscience in us. Uh, but when it comes to a Christian, we are to hold each other accountable. You know that passage that says, "Do not judge, yet, lest ye be judged." That's not referring to uh, it's not referring to to church discipline. It's because uh, judging really means to to believe a person is condemned. To, to judge them the way God would judge them. Like, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. don't deserve eternal life, and you should go to hell. That's, that's you know, judgment. That's judgment. Mm-hmm. So when you tell a person, you know, you're doing something sinful, that's not judging. That's holding them accountable. That's actually loving them. I mean, if you're doing it with the right attitude, if your attitude is you want to win your brother back mm-hmm. to, so that in, through repentance they'll be saved, that is uh, what God wants us to do, and that's not judging. Um, but the people outside of the church are not... the. They're not the ones that we should be worrying about because, they're, first of all, if they don't believe in God, then anything we tell them is not going to help them. They're not going to believe us either. Mm-hmm. So they're not really under our jurisdiction. People in the church are under the jurisdiction of God's uh, discipline out of love. And so God places shepherds like pastors and other leaders in the church, as well as other Christians, to rally around each other, to lift each other up, to, to point out sin so that people will repent and come back to salvation. Because we don't want to lose people. I mean, 1 Corinthians is all about a man who, um, you know, was sleeping with his stepmother, right? And so that was one of the issues in that church. And he says, such things don't even happen among the pagans. This is evil. If this man doesn't repent, you have to kick him out of the church. And, and so he, uh, Paul was reprimanding the Corinthians for not doing that. So the loving thing to do was to, uh, was to hold him accountable to his sin, and to, uh, ter- to help him to see that he needed to change. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, starting in verse 4, it says, Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. So notice that, you know, when we talk about what is the job of, of an older woman, it's not only that they should live respectful lives and not have these uh, vices like being addicted or s- slandering, but their job is to, is to serve as examples and mentors for the younger women. So he says, you know, they can train the younger women to love their husbands. Now, why do the younger women need to be trained to do that? Uh, I mean, is that something that wouldn't that be something that you know people who are married would already have so natural. yeah well and the fact is that you know falling in love is one thing and that that's maybe uh, uh there are you know hormones that cause people to have these feelings but what happens is the uh, that there's a natural tendency for that level of of being in love to dissipate and usually within two years after falling in love the feelings dissipate and so then you have a, a choice to either ha- be committed to a person out of your vows and what God's will tells us to do, or some people who are addicted to love, they move on to the next person because they lose the feeling and then they, they don't feel that they, are in love, that they love that person anymore. See, but they're, what, they're not, what they're doing is they're not really loving the other person. They're in love with being in love, wow. right? So that... That's um, the wrong emphasis, right? So you, instead of thinking about the person, you're thinking about your own feelings. It's a very selfish thing. So uh, the older women who have already experienced these e- the ebb and flow of relationships with their husbands, you know, they, they probably had times where they hated their husbands, where they were fighting with them, but they stayed married. And so that's something that needs to be taught to the younger women. M- one of the problems with the epidemic of divorce in our country today is a result of there are no examples. The older uh, men and women are not staying married, are not being examples to the younger people. So when you think about it, the people um, who g- grew up in the 60s 
who ended up having this idea of free love and of have many, many divorces in the last 40 years, is it any wonder that their children either are not getting married or can't stay married, right? They think about mm -hmm. it. There's, the, the divorce rate is pretty high and the, the, the rate of people living together without marriage has skyrocketed. And the re result is because of the, their parents who didn't see marriage as a, something that they saw as valuable or noble or something to, uh, to um, protect. And because they just threw it away, then their children don't have an example. And so the only way to fix this is for Christians who see marriage as a gift of God, that is a, a blessing of, of the Lord, need to teach their children. So the older women are to teach the younger women. And when it says to love their husbands, we're not talking about being in love. We're talking about caring for their husbands with the kind of love that it says in 1 Corinthians 13, the kind of love that Jesus has for us, mm -hmm. to be patient and kind. You know, and God knows that women need to be patient with men because they can be stubborn and stupid. <laughs> and, and to be patient with, uh, with your husband is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just submitting. It's not being walked on. It's not being taken advantage of. It's God's will for people in general in marriage to love each other and really in, in all relationships is to love people unconditionally, mm -hmm. that you're, w you're willing to forgive them, uh, being patient with people, being kind. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people treat uh, strangers, like, you know, if you work at a company, sometimes you're real friendly with the people you work with, you're kind, but you don't treat your own family members that kindly. And so, you know, we should s treat our own family members better if not the same as we treat other people. Um, so uh, training these younger women to love their husbands really is to, to stay in love, to practice the acts of love, which, which is the decision. So according to the Bible, love is a decision that you make consciously. It's not based on who the other person is, like, oh, are you worth loving? Are you good enough to love? Do you give me what I want? No, it's I choose to love you because God has loved me and, and I will forgive you and I will be patient with you and I'll be kind to you. Now, you know, in the world there's always uh, problems and if a, if a husband is not um, caring for his wife, not doing the things that God has called him to do, there may be times where separation is necessary. And of course, as Jesus said, in, the term, in terms of infidelity, then, the, then there is a grounds for divorce. But here is just talking about the, uh, how to protect relationships. So Paul is not getting into the other stuff. He's just simply saying, teach them to, to take the steps by which a marriage will be um, safeguarded. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a woman can safeguard her marriage by loving her husband and her children. And then it goes on, as we read, to be self-controlled and pure. To be busy at home is, on, is, con, is the contrary um, um, point as opposed to being a busy body, right? Being a busy body is, is being busy about everybody else's business. Like, you know, what's going on in this person's life? It's really gossip. And so to busy at home, being busy at home really is, is the way of protecting yourself from gossiping, right? If you're not thinking about what other people are doing, you're thinking about what you should be doing, caring for your children, mm -hmm. cleaning your house. You know, in our feminist world today where people think that anything that is supposedly a woman's role is putting her down, mm -hmm. somebody's got to do the work. And it's not, it doesn't mean that men can't do these things. And he doesn't go into details about what it means to be busy at home. So it's not that the Bible is um, misogynist. It's not saying that the Bible is against women. But the Bible does recognize that men and women have different roles. And, and so... Like in uh, Ephesians 5, when Paul talks about how a husband should love his wife and the wife should respect her husband, the reason why he gives those two different uh, words is because what men need from, uh, uh, from their wife is respect, and what women need from their husbands is love. Mm -hmm. And those things uh, are, don't always come naturally. So when we're doing uh, what God has called us in our role and marriage to do, then uh, marriages are protected. Uh, and he also goes on to say the things that, again, that are very similar to, um, to the uh, fruit of the Spirit at 1 Corinthians 13 as well, to be kind. And this last section here, to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Uh, you know, in this society, when this was written, 
for a, a woman to, you know, not listen to her husband would would paint the Christian faith as being something that would be offensive. So does that mean that that uh, all Christian women have to be subject to their husbands, and, and so that a woman who d decides that she's going to work outside the home or or have a career that she's breaking God's law? Well, no, because to be subject to their husband doesn't go into the details about what those things are. And in different societies and different times, there may be different views of that. So, for instance, in our society, if a, if a woman is subject to her husband, that means that she talks to her husband about the things that she's doing, and they come to an agreement about what is right. So if a woman's working outside the home and the husband has no problem with that, then that's being subject to her husband. If the husband said, you know, I don't want you to do this, and you know that would be something you should talk about before you get married, right? You don't just you don't just marry a person and tell them, well, I don't think it's right for you to work outside the home, and uh, and she wanted to have a career, that wouldn't be right. You should talk about those things before you get married, but um, it has to do with uh, what uh, husbands and wives uh, agree to, and what's acceptable in the society. Something that brings shame to. Uh, to a marriage and to the Christian faith is something that shouldn't be done. Uh, you know, and you know, we can just imagine what those things might be. But I think in the Roman world, um, if a woman were to, uh, you know, to be like in charge of the family, I mean, in some ways there was things that people did in the ancient world that were like that. A lot of times the women, uh, they were in charge of the of uh, the education of the children. They were in charge of sometimes like the finances of the family. You know, they may not have been earning the money, but they still organized mm -hmm. the home. And so there was a type of control, uh, and that was so something that was expected and it was uh, noble. Uh, you know, if you look at Proverbs 31, it talks about how a woman of God is the woman who she brings joy to her husband and, and makes him uh, proud because she goes to the marketplace and she knows how to, uh, mm -hmm. to purchase uh, things and and then to re and then to resell them and to have a business. It actually describes a woman in the ancient Israelite community being a businesswoman, a smart businesswoman. And she's a jewel in the crown of her husband, husband's uh, head. So that definitely is. Um, uh, there's room in the way that the scripture describes uh, husbands and wives to describe uh, different. Uh, relationships and different ways for men and women to interact. So there are no, um, you know, there's no confines or boundaries saying women can't do certain things uh, when, unless it comes to something explicitly in Scripture. So the Bible doesn't uh, explicitly give the uh, responsibility of the of being a pastor or an elder to a woman. You know, it, it always mentions that an elder or a pastor should be a husband of one wife. It never says a wife of one husband. It never mentions women being pastors. And then the passages in, that Paul talks about how women should not uh, have spiritual authority over men, you know, is one of the biblical understandings that has traditionally been understood to exclude women from ministry. But it doesn't exclude women from uh, exclude women from being a pastor or an elder. It doesn't exclude them from ministry in general because other women like Aquila and Priscilla, uh, husband and wife team, were evangelists. And so they definitely both preached the gospel. Okay, and then, um, and so he, when he says to, um, that the whole point of doing these things is not to restrict women, but so that they would bring glory to God's name. Because it, the whole point is not to malign the word of God. Uh, other people who would hear about the gospel or hear about what it meant to be a Christian if they see Christians acting strange or living lives that are disrespectful, that, that's not just bad for them, but it's bad for the word of God. And so Christians should always help others to see that God's word is, is true, it's valuable, and it's important, and it's what we try to live by. And if, if we're not doing that, then we're just bringing shame to the gospel. Okay, well, we're going to uh, stop here. and we'll, The next section is about young men, starting at verse 6.